Good afternoon. The first item of business today is portfolio questions, and we start with question number one from Richard Lyle. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what the NHS policy is on prescribing wigs for patients receiving private health care. Cabinet Secretary Jean Freeman. The prescribing of wigs is dependent on clinical assessment and individual need. The Scottish Government has previously issued guidance on the provision of wigs to all NHS boards to allow them to deliver services that meet the needs of their local population, and we would expect any independent healthcare provider to administer all necessary treatment for each episode of care. Richard Lyle. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. Being told that you have cancer is a blow to anyone, especially family members. What a cancer sufferer does not need, whether they are private or NHS patient, is officialdom or red tape. That's what the lady got until officials realised who they were dealing with. The policy is quite clear and should be implemented that way. My thanks to the officer in space for answering my inquiry in a matter of hours. As I spoke to the patient, her young son drew this. It says it all. We want the wig. Her son uh, said it all. The patient got her wig, by the way. My question is, will the Cabinet Secretary ensure that a policy set out to aid all cancer patients is implemented correctly and that patients, whether private or NHS, are treated with respect and get the service they deserve. Cabinet Secretary. I'm grateful to Mr Lyle for his supplementary and I couldn't agree with him more. Uh, when you receive a diagnosis like cancer uh, or indeed any other uh, life-threatening diagnosis such as that, the last thing you need is more red tape and bureaucracy. I'm very happy to confirm that I will ensure that our guidelines are reissued again uh, across all our boards, but also to uh, those private healthcare providers uh, that we are in contact with to ensure that all our patients uh, are treated with the dignity and respect that they deserve. Monica Lennon. Thank you. Um, I've also been assisting a, a constituent. Um, she has alopecia, and that's um, prompted me to, to write to health boards to ask for a breakdown about the, the number of um, real hair wigs that are offered to patients uh, alongside synthetic. It's proven very difficult to get the data, Cabinet Secretary, so I wonder is there anything the Scottish Government could do uh, to help health boards improve the data that they hold so that patients with alopecia and other conditions um, get the, the right uh, type of wig that they need and, and deserve in terms of quality? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, thank you. I'm grateful to Ms Lennon. This is a really important issue. My understanding is that NHS patients may receive up to four what are described as stock wigs uh, as required per year. For human hair wigs, new pa patients with long-term hair loss may be prescribed one human hair wig per year or two initially in the first year to last 24 months and then one uh, wig per year thereafter. So that is my understanding of what is currently. I'm quite happy to um, write to the member and set that out. Uh, but also uh, to look a bit further at the, the way in which data is collected by our boards so that the kind of questions that Ms Lennon is asking uh, can be more easily answered. But in the meantime, I will set that out for you. Thank you very much. Question two has been withdrawn. Question number three, Gil Patterson. Uh, many thanks, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government how the rollout of GP Premises Sustainability Fund will help reduce barriers to recruitment of GPs. Cabinet Secretary. <clears throat> the GP Premises Sustainability Fund, uh, a long-term interest-free loan of up to 20% of premises value, is in, in direct response to concerns raised by the BMA and GPs, and it aims to ease the financial risk associated with owning a premises uh, in, and in turn therefore helping GP recruitment and retention. The risk is considered to deter particularly new GPs as they need to raise funds to buy into practice premises and uh, are anxious or, or unwilling to take on uh, the associated financial risks. And that uh, has been evidenced as a barrier to some degree to recruitment. So the rollout of the GP Premises Sustainability Fund, uh, the first 30 million uh, has already been approved and allocated. We uh, last week announced an additional 20 million to that fund and the reopening uh, of applications, bringing forward the time frame between 2019 to 2021. Uh, and so far, all the feedback we've had from those GPs and indeed from the BMA uh, has been very positive in terms of responding directly to their concerns and we hope easing this risk and increasing recruitment and retention. 
Gil Patterson. Uh, can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer and uh, to say that the, the feedback that you've got is very similar to my own uh, because I know that this is a very critical factor in GP practices in my own constituency. Therefore, I, I very much welcome the Scottish Government's ongoing commitments to the recruitment and retention of GPs. And I, you've answered some of the, the questions, Cabinet Secretary, and I thank you for that. But can the Scottish Government confirm how much funding has been allocated in total uh, to support both the GP uh, premises loan scheme and the new con the GP contract? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, so we uh, had initially allocated over 140 million to support both the uh, premises loan scheme and the new GP contract and wider primary care reform in 2018-19. Uh, that 30 million, of course, that was part of that 140, I have now increased to 50 million. Uh, so that in total is our current investment uh, in uh, this aspect of the recruitment and retention of GPs. Miles Briggs, to be followed by David Stewart. Thank you, President Officer. I welcome the GP Premises Sustainability Fund and indeed called for it some two years ago. It's vital that we make sure Scotland's GP surgeries are sustainable and any prohibitive costs are addressed, which face GPs and GP staff. The vast majority of GP practices across the country, 793 surgeries are privately run by doctors themselves and not the local health board. Can I therefore ask the Cabinet Secretary if she can confirm today that all GP surgeries in Scotland will not be included in the SMP car park tax proposals. Cabinet Secretary. So, so I have to say, Ms. Mr Briggs, that is such a wasted opportunity on your part. Um, you are the shadow spokesperson for health and this is the best that you can do. The, the, you know as well as I do, and we will debate this tomorrow, you know as well as I do that what is being talked about here is an additional power for local authorities to use or not as they choose. What, what the Finance Secretary has made clear, he's made clear more than once, I believe I have done it too, is that NHS staff will not be required to pay uh, those, uh, that tax should the local authority concerned implement it. And of course, that applies to those GP premises who have a contract with us to provide NHS care. Now, do you know, how much clearer can we be on this? And perhaps the next time you would actually ask a question that is relevant to the health portfolio. David Stewart, be followed by Neil Findlay. Uh, thank you, President Officer. I welcome all and any initiative to improve the sustainability of general practice, particularly in rural areas. Um, however, I read in the National Code of Practice that health boards will have a new power uh, to withdraw both notional rent and borrowing cost payments to GPs. Could the Cabinet Secretary outline in more detail where and when the new powers could be used? Cabinet Secretary. So I, I, think, I think, Mr Stewart, I'm grateful to you for the question. I think you are referring to the new scheme in terms of lease, uh, where uh, so some GP practices, as we know, own the premises. That's where the loan scheme comes into uh, play. Others, of course, do not own, but rent their premises. Uh, and what we are offering is an opportunity for those GP practices for that lease to be taken on by the health board, thereby alleviating some of the risk that the practice might face in terms of a private landlord and also offering uh, longer term security uh, to the lease provision. Uh, I think that is what Mr Stewart is asking me. Uh, that, will, uh, that is part of the overall primary care uh, reform programme and is already underway. It will be taken up uh, much more so, I'm sure, in 1920. And again, if, if the member wants more details on that, I'm very happy to provide it. Neil Findlay. Um, for the first time since the creation of the National Health Service in 1948, the village of Stonyburn has no GP service. The premises are there, they need improvement, but there is no doctor within the health centre. Does the Cabinet Secretary agree with me that that is completely unacceptable? And will she come with me to see the premises and to speak to local people about the fact that they no longer have a GP? Cabinet Secretary. So my understanding of this situation is that uh, my officials are in contact with West, West Lothian Health and Social Care Partnership, who, of course, uh, have uh, planning and commissioning responsibility in this area. They've advised me of the decision to continue to provide consolidated GP services for all patients registered at the Brake Valley Medical Practice, including patients living in Stonyburn. 
uh, that they remain committed to retaining the Stonybourne Community Health Centre, where patients can access a wider range of community health services, uh, including district nursing, health visitors, and so on, and are also looking at ways of bolstering services to the Stonybourne community, uh, and with house housebound patients continuing to receive exactly the same services as they do at the moment. What I am happy to do is to look further at this matter, indeed discuss it uh, uh, personally with uh, Mr Finlay, and see if there is more that we can do at this point. Question number four, Claudia Beamish. Thank you, presiding <coughs> officer. To ask the Scottish Government what role the third sector organisations such as Healthy Valleys in Lanark play in supporting preventative health and other community-led health initiatives. Minister Joe Fitzpatrick. I'm going to take the opportunity to uh, acknowledge the very important work that community-based organisations <coughs> such as Healthy Valleys play in addressing the challenges of inequality in health and the complex issues that lie behind these. Scotland's strong and dynamic third sector plays a crucial role in the drive for social justice and inclusive economic growth, and it's essential to the reform of public services and to the well-being of our communities. This is reflected in our continuing financial support for the sector via the core third sector uh, budget and a range of other planned expenditure across portfolios. Claudia Beamish. Thank the Minister for that answer. And while, of course, the core budget is very important, um, does the Minister agree with me that there need to be some sorts of guidelines, and I don't know if the Scottish Government has this already, and indeed specific plans to help organisations such as Healthy Valleys um, to gain a more assured future as organisations, as many are reliant on short-term unreliable grant funding, which makes it difficult to support specialist and indeed quite remote rural areas in working preventatively with continuity. Yes. Thank the member for, for, for the point. Um, we'd um, absolutely encourage um, organisations such as um, Healthy Valleys um, to work with their funding partners um, to, to, to support them to continue their good, the good work going forward and on, on a more sustainable basis. Um, the Scottish Government continues to look at how we can support this activity and we're currently considering how future funding under Empowering Communities Fund can be streamlined to, to support that and improve delivery. And Brian Whittle. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, actually, the Cabinet Secretary and I recently attended uh, the launch of a collaboration between two third sector organisations in Yip World and Cycle Station. I think that, that sort of the collaboration is something that, that, that we, would, we would like to see uh, promoted. But I wonder if the, the Minister agrees with me that currently the way that the third sector is funding makes this type of collaboration difficult. And isn't it about time we looked at the way we can align the third sector uh, and fund them in such a way as this type of collaboration becomes uh, m m more and more? Yes. I, I think the member makes, it makes a good, good point. I think I've, I've already said that, that collaboration is, is really important and, and these sorts of organisations need to work with their funding partners. There needs to be partnership working. The, the models of social prescribing, I think, are something which we all agree we want to encourage um, going forward in the future. And you know, part, part of that is to look at how we, how we use the funds we have. So that's why it's important that we are specifically looking at... Um, what the funding models are and, and how we're using those funds under the um, Empowering Community Funds to, to better streamline delivery. But we need to make sure that right across all portfolios that we're joined up as possible to make sure that we are supporting the kind of initiative that the, the member mentions. Question number five, Liam Kerr. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what plans it has to review the NRAC funding formula for NHS boards. Cabinet Secretary. There are currently no plans to review the NRAC funding formula for NHS boards. The formula has been used in NHS Scotland since 2009, following its approval by all NHS boards and the Technical Advisory Group on Resource Allocation. It is updated on an annual basis on the basis of statistical analysis by experts and remains the most objective and robust method of allocating health service funding on an equitable basis. Liam Kerr. Thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. This year, our health boards are getting an average uplift of 3.8%. That is less than the 5.3% uplift for the overall health budget. Health boards deliver the vast majority of NHS work, and thanks to Barnet Consequentials and the spending decisions of the UK government, an extra £2 billion is coming north for our NHS. So how will the Cabinet Secretary allocate this extra money to guarantee our health boards get the funding they deserve? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, well, of course, Mr Kerr is d displaying a, a significant misunderstanding uh, of all of the funding in our health service and the various uh, means by which it gets uh, to 
to patients, which is actually the most important thing. So, of course, NHS boards uh, receive an allocation. In addition, of, uh, he will be aware of the Waiting Times Improvement Plan, which is providing additional resources, the 160 million in the draft budget. Of course, it does depend on this parliament uh, approving that draft budget uh, tomorrow, which includes in that uh, the funding to uh, extend free personal care to under 65s, something I know Mr. Briggs was very keen to, uh, promote quite rightly uh, and I hope he will support tomorrow. Uh, all of that is going, that 160 million for those additional provisions goes through our health and social care partnerships going to local authorities. So if you look in the round uh, overall the uh, level of health spending uh, on uh, patients and of course our commitment which we honour consistently to pass all health consequentials into the health portfolio that you will see that we continue to increase our spending in health and are on track to achieve uh, our target of shifting the balance of care from acute to that community setting. Kenneth Gibson. Thank you, President Officer. Does the Cabinet Secretary agree that there won't be any increase in NHS uh, funding if the budget isn't passed tomorrow? And does she also agree that any future review of the NHS Scotland Resource Allocation Committee funding formula must take greater account of poverty and deprivation, given that these are primary indicators of likely health need? Cabinet Secretary. Well, of, of course, Mr Gibson is completely accurate. It does depend on Parliament's decision tomorrow on the draft 19 20 budget exactly uh, where we stand in terms of our health service. I remain ever hopeful that all members will understand the vital importance of the additional resource that we are putting into health and, and will find themselves able to support that. Uh, he is also right that uh, poverty and deprivation are key elements uh, in the NRAC formula uh, uh, in order to support access to health care according to need. In recent reviews, as I've said, by independent experts have ensured that the formula remains fit for purpose. Of course, as with all formulas, um, it is not an exact or perfect science uh, and should always remain open uh, to continued consideration as to its effectiveness. Mike Rumbles. The, the Scottish Parliament Information Centre have produced research that says Grampian NHS has received £239 million below their NRAC target allocation over the last 10 years. Would the Cabinet Secretary accept that it's not the NRAC formula at fault here, but the constant failure to meet the NRAC allocation every year since 2009? Cabinet Secretary. So, Mr Rumbos will know that uh, what the government has been trying to do in a staged manner, because of course, moving all boards to uh, as close as possible parity with the NRAC formula requires some boards to lose some funding as well as other boards to increase it. And over that time, we have moved progressively to get to a position where all boards uh, are uh, within 0.8% uh, of parity with the formula. So the figures that he refers to, of course, uh, are figures that date back to a point where uh, Grampian was minus 4.8% uh, in terms of its parity, uh, close to parity for the NRAC formula. So we are making progressive moves towards increasing the equity uh, and fairness in the application of that formula, and we will continue to do so uh, on the basis that we need to do it in those stages because, of course, every penny of money uh, relates to a direct service to patients and you need to take it in that staged and sensible manner. Question number six, June McAlpine. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government how it has enhanced the role of clinical nurse specialists in the NHS and what the benefits are. Cabinet Secretary, Jean Freeman. Uh, so, um, the, the role of clinical nurse specialists is an important role one in our health service and they have developed uh, across a range of specialisms over a number of years and what we are currently engaged in is a, a transforming nursing roles program. Uh, within that the specialist short life working group has been established to look at the, the clinical nurse specialist role. Uh, the aim of it is to clarify the role regardless of the specialism, reduce variation uh, across our country and duplication in the roles uh, and also uh, have a clear focus on what uh, is the total uh, education and training and support requirements to clinical nurse specialists to uh, improve and enhance patient care. Uh, that work has begun 
Uh, I'm told that it is expected to be completed uh, in a year's time, but I have asked officials <coughs> if there is any way in which it could either produce some interim recommendations or complete its work much earlier than that. June McAlpine. Uh, I thank the Cabinet Secretary and very much welcome that answer. Uh, RCN recommend that all children with epilepsy are seen by a specialist nurse, and that's happening in every health board area in Scotland except in Priest and Galloway. Even the borders with a smaller population has this covered. Now, 150 to 250 estimated children and young people in Dumfries and Galloway live with epilepsy. And while I understand that it is a matter for the board, that's little comfort to these families. So I wondered if the government can put any pressure on Dumfries and Galloway Health Board to change its position and catch up with the excellent uh, position in the rest of Scotland. Thank you. Cabinet Secretary. I'm grateful uh, to Ms McAlpine for her supplementary question and I would share the concern that she obviously has that Dumfries and Galloway appear to be an outlier in uh, what is a pretty important area, not least uh, for those families that she mentions. So I, I am giving the member uh, this assurance now that I will personally look at why Dumfries and Galloway's board has taken the view that it has, what it perceives to be the barriers in its way as opposed to any of our other health boards and how we might assist them to overcome those barriers and meet that recommendation. Michelle Ballantyne. Thank you, presiding officer. Given recent reports of extremely high accident and emergency demand at Borders General Hospital, which culminated in a public appeal by the Director of Nursing and Acute Services urging people to only visit A&E in the case of serious medical emergency, I would like to ask, how does the Cabinet Secretary see uh, the enhanced role of clinical nurse specialists easing the pressure on NHS Scotland's strained A&E departments? Cabinet Secretary. Um, well, well, I think there are a number of enhanced roles, if you like, that can uh, address the additional pressure on our A&E departments. And uh, Ms Ballantyne is correct uh, to point to uh, additional demand. We've actually been experiencing additional demand f even over last year, uh, which, as members will recall, was a particularly difficult year in terms of weather and flu and so on. Uh, but even over last year, there's additional demand over a number of weeks across almost all of our A&E departments to varying percentage increases. Uh, so as well as looking to ensure that all our uh, emergency departments uh, are applying the, the six key actions, which are agreed to be the six key actions, uh, to ensure that they uh, operate as effectively as possible. We are looking at, with health boards at, uh, two, and with health and social care partnerships at two other areas. One is the flow through the hospital, uh, and that includes delayed discharge, of course, but it also includes the flow through the hospital uh, and also uh, at how we, I, don't want to, I don't want to say to people, don't go to your A&E department. What I want the emergency department and the hospital front door to be able to do is to then signpost people appropriately. So, for example, the Royal Infirmary of Edinburgh has recently opened, beside its emergency department, a minor injuries unit so that people who are coming to that front door um, are properly signposted next door, if you like, to the minor injuries unit where they will be treated properly. And in that unit, we have then the role for a range of professional input, not least physiotherapists, but also um, advanced nurse practitioners, uh, as well as uh, medics and clinical nurse specialists, where that is relevant, depending on the nature of the demand. So we are looking at making the best possible use of the range of professional disciplines and skills that we have in our health service, increasing those and enhancing them, but at the same time being able to give the patient the care and the skill that they need at the point when they need it. And Emma Harper. Thank you. The British Government, how the implementation of advanced nurse practitioners, which are different to clinical nurse specialists, in primary care, such as in GP practices, are benefiting communities, particularly in rural areas, such as Dumfries and Galloway in my South Scotland region. Cabinet Secretary. Um, well, of course, Ms Harper is right in the advanced nurse practitioners do differ from clinical nurse practitioners. They have a really important role, which is why we've committed to train uh, 500 uh, advanced nurse practitioners by 2021. Their role in primary care and in GP practices and in some of the linked uh, community-based services uh, that I touched on there with uh, Ms Ballantyne earlier and others uh, is to support both joined up 
anticipatory and preventative care uh, because they can work with individuals in their local community. And in uh, my own constituency, I have seen advanced nurse practitioners uh, take on a number of roles uh, inside that primary care setting, which has allowed the GP to step forward into the role that the new contract uh, wishes the GP to be in and the BMA wish them to be in, which is that clinical general specialist lead uh, in that local community for that uh, team of healthcare practitioners, including the advanced, advanced nurse practitioner. Question seven, Stuart Stevenson. To ask the Scottish Government what it is doing to ensure that the commitment to develop rural clinics aligns with the needs of NHS boards and clinicians. Great Secretary. Thank you. So we are committed to ensuring healthcare services provide high quality sustainable care for patients uh, across communities, including those in rural areas. Integration authorities are responsible for planning local services in line with national policies and local priorities, and they have a statutory duty to consult partners, stakeholders and professional groups as part of their strategic commissioning process. The Memorandum of Understanding, published alongside the new GP contract, is clear that primary care redesign needs to be safe, effective and accessible to all and agreed with local clinical pro professionals. Uh, so that should help ensure that in particularly rural, remote and rural areas, but elsewhere across the country, the services that are redesigned under primary care as part of our overall uh, primary care reform with that additional resource meet the particular needs of those local communities through that consultation and with that statutory responsibility on our health and social care partnerships. Stuart Stevenson. Uh, the Cabinet Secretary will be aware that in many rural communities, uh, access to carers is important and access to transport relatively limited. And in the light of that, will the Cabinet Secretary encourage the integration services to take those factors into account when uh, designing uh, the new way in which uh, rural clinics will be operated and offered? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, I'm very happy to give Mr Stevenson that uh, commitment. I know from my own experience in my own constituency that you can look at a map and think that it's not that far from A to B, but actually in that uh, rural area, it will take a great deal longer than it will do in perhaps our more central belt locations. So I'm very happy to give him the commitment uh, to make sure that our integration authorities take those factors into account wherever they are commissioning and planning services. Question number eight, Rhoda Grant. To ask the Scottish Government how many hours on-call ambulance drivers can safely work in addition to their day shifts. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, all working patterns in NHS Scotland meet the limits of the working time regulations, which includes the average 48-hour working week and the required minimum daily and weekly rest periods. Over the last 12 months, on-call working for ambulance crews has been eliminated in Wick, Thurzo and Dufftown, and an announcement was made last week to recruit to six new ambulance posts, which will eliminate on-call working in Portree. The Scottish Ambulance Service uh, recognises the concerns staff have around fatigue related to on-call working and have agreed in partnership a fatigue policy which is designed to address these concerns. Rhoda Grant. Ambulance crews in remote rural areas work their day shift hours and then are cover the rest of the 24-hour period on an on-call basis. And this can mean that they work their full day shift but then be called out in the middle of the night. And in my region, some of those call-outs can involve a round trip of over six hours on top of the day shift already worked. If they were employed as professional drivers, this would be illegal and indeed they could be charged with dangerous driving. They can register as fatigued, that is up to them, but if they do so, they cannot return home. Can I ask the Cabinet Secretary to investigate this practice and ensure that the health and safety of these crews and indeed their patients is safeguarded? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, I'm grateful uh, to Ms Grant for that supplementary question and I, I understand the point that she is making. I'm happy to confirm to her that I will have further discussions with the Scottish Ambulance Service around that point and will write to her in due course uh, on the basis of the outcome of those discussions. Question number nine, Alistair Allen. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on plans to replace St Brendan's Hospital in Barra. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, 
I'm grateful to Mr. Allen uh, for his question. And can I say at the outset, I completely understand the frustrations I'm sure he feels, and certainly that local community feels, at what appears to have been a lengthy process. The Health Board, the local authority and the Scottish Government, though, remain committed to delivering the St Brendan's reprovision at the earliest opportunity. Uh, the outline business case was approved in April uh, 2018. Work continues between the Health Board, the Council and the Integrated Joint Board with the support of the Scottish Futures Trust to determine the best approach for delivery of the hospital project and the Castle Bay Community Hub, integrated or separate solutions, to ensure that public infrastructure best meets the need of the local population and provides effective and sustainable health and education resource for the future. However, we have been clear, and I want to be clear again today in the Chamber, that while we are supportive of NHS Western Isles exploring this opportunity, we do not wish this to create any delay in the submission of the full business case for the Health Centre. Alistair Allen. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that very helpful answer. Will she acknowledge that people in Barra have been waiting a very long time for NHS Western Isles to provide a replacement hospital? Uh, I will be in Barra this Friday and I know my constituents there will want to be reassured that in whatever form this project is realised, any changes will not delay the submission of a full business case or indeed the government's commitment to provide a new hospital by 2021. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, I'm very happy to give Mr Allen that absolute assurance. I have asked my officials to uh, provide me with an update on where, uh, where we are uh, between the submission of the outline business case about 10 months ago and what I would expect to see as a full business case very shortly. Uh, should there be any particular hiccups or hitches in that, then I will expect my officials to intervene and assist uh, that health board to uh, produce that uh, full business case at the earliest possible opportunity so that we can make good our commitment and those assurances which I know we have given many times and it is time now for us to ensure that they are delivered. Question number 10, Annabel Ewing. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, to <coughs> ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on out of hours urgent care in NHS Fife. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, Fife Health and Social Care Partnership are in the process of carrying out further work with the communities and key stakeholders across Fife following the meeting of the Integrated Joint Board on the 20th of December, where the decision on the future of out of our services was postponed until the community participation request had been answered. I understand that NHS Fife expect to communicate with community groups uh, on that matter as soon as possible, and I have, been, I have asked to be kept informed. Annabelle Ewing. Uh, I thank the Cabinet Secretary for her answer, but as the MSP for Cowden Beath constituency, I would stress that uh, overnight out of hours urgent care at the Queen Margaret Hospital in Dunfermline, as well as in Glenrothes and St Andrews, has been suspended for nearly 11 months now. So could the Cabinet Secretary therefore use her good offices to ensure that Fife Health and Social Care Partnership now resolve matters in the interests of individuals and families in Fife? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, I'm grateful to uh, Ms Ewing for her supplementary question. As she knows, uh, I was very concerned in December uh, that uh, the Integration Authority might take what I considered to be a precipitative decision. Uh, I'm grateful that they have postponed that and undertook, undertaken the further work that I think was required. So I'm very uh, keen to assure her uh, that I am taking a very close interest in this matter. I understand a progress report on a number of the outstanding issues will be given to the IJB meeting in April, and I am I'm assured that some progress has been made, including, for example, the introduction of a new remuneration rate for GPs, which has supported an increase in the number of GPs providing regular sessions. In addition, continued support and investment in nurse training and the use of paramedics is improving resilience in the short and longer term. I absolutely understand the need for consistency and resilience in this, in this service, and my officials will continue to work with Fife Health and Social Care Partnership during this period, and I will ensure that I am kept uh, regularly up to date. Alexander Stewart, to be followed by Claire Baker. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Can I ask what steps is the Cabinet Secretary taking to ensure that staff shortages will not lead to further centralisation of out of our services in Fife? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, well, uh, I'm very clean, clear that there are a number of issues that the Health and Social Care Partnership need to address to ensure that there is uh, 
as reasonable as possible equity of access to out of hour services. I had the benefit of some discussion uh, with uh, GPs from St Andrews in terms of uh, the propositions that they uh, had put and, and their consideration of what might be appropriate and possible there. Uh, all of those matters uh, are in my mind as I look to continue to be updated on where we, uh, how they are going uh, in that health and social care partnership in terms of the consultation and the final set of propositions that they want to bring forward. So I, I take uh, Mr Stewart's point. I don't believe it is entirely a matter of staff shortages and already I've outlined uh, some improvements in that regard. Uh, I think it is uh, about understanding what is most, most suitable for those local communities and in, t in terms of, we touched on it earlier, uh, issues like transport and so on, ease of access uh, to some of those out of hours facilities. So that's what I'll be looking for when I see their final proposals. Claire Baker to be followed by Jenny Gilruth. Um, thank you. The Cabinet Secretary may be aware that December 2018 saw the highest number of patients attend the downscaled out of hours services, which is based in Kirkcaldy and Victoria. That's higher than any time over the past four years. So does the Cabinet Secretary agree with me that these numbers illustrate the demand for the service? Share my concern that this centralisation disadvantages communities who live out with Kirkcaldy and earlier she talked about rural distances and I hope she recognises Fife does come into that category. And notwithstanding what she's already said, does she commit to supporting NHS Fife to increase the pool of GPs who will work out of hours? I understand an advert that was put up at the end of last year had no applications at all for a post that was advertised for GP out of hours in Fife. Cabinet Secretary. Yeah, so <clears throat> I, I hope Ms Baker is assured that I, I do understand the issues uh, that she is raising. Uh, I understand the point uh, about uh, remote and rural areas and having travelled in Fife myself. I, I, it looks like a relatively um, compact area on a map. It's precisely my point. Uh, but travelling those roads uh, is less uh, straightforward than perhaps in other parts of our country. Um, there has been some work to increase the number of GPs who are prepared to work out of hours, but also to look more widely at, as I spoke about in earlier questions, to the wider professional skill mix that would be appropriate for out of hours services. At not least some of our uh, uh, increased enhanced paramedic facilities as well as advanced nurse practitioners. So that will be what I'm looking for in the mix to ensure that we have as far as is possible equity of access to uh, out of our services across uh, the Kingdom of Fife. Uh, and that's what I'll be looking for when that Health and Social Care Partnership come forward with their proposals. Jenny Gilruth. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Can I ask the Cabinet Secretary if she's able to update members on the transport appraisal for Glenrothes Hospital's GP out of our service to assure my constituents that access to transportation at the Victoria Hospital has been assessed appropriately? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, I'm grateful to Ms Gilruth for her question. Um, obviously, if I'd had advance notice of that, then I would have ensured that I had that information. I do not have that information. I'm happy to forward it to her. Question number 11, Bill Kidd. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what action it is taking to support the upgrade of sports pitches in Annie's Land to 3G multi-use game areas. Thank you. Minister, Minister Joe Fitzpatrick. The Scottish Government routes plans and applications for upgrading and maintenance of sporting facilities through Sport Scotland, the National Agency for Sport. Sport Scotland are not aware of any current proposals for pitch developments in Annie's Land area. However, they would be willing to discuss potential applications from clubs and or community groups seeking support. <coughs> Bill Kidd. Uh, thank the Minister for that response. I, I know that um, the Scottish Government has been proactive in supporting uh, upgrades for sports in primary schools, including within my Annie's Land constituency. And can I ask the Minister then to confirm whether the Scottish Government will work with Glasgow and other councils across Scotland to provide further progress in ensuring that secondary schools also make the upgrade to 3G pitches? Minister. Thank the Member for his answer. I understand that um, Glasgow City Council has asked uh, Glasgow Life to lead a review of the existing pitch strategy in Glasgow. So that's uh, focusing on the same sports as their existing strategy, including football, rugby union, rugby league, hockey, cricket, tennis, bowls, shinty and basketball. And that, that review is uh, looking at the strategic supply of and demand for pitches across uh, the, the city. Um, 
but of, co of course, um, if you have the focus of Glasgow Council is, is on increasing provision of grass and synthetic pitches um, across the city, and Sports Scotland would be very happy to discuss that matter further with Glasgow City Council. Question 12, Neil Bibby. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on infection control measures at the Royal Alexandra Hospital and NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde. Cabinet Secretary. Um, I'm grateful to Mr Bibby for the question. Can I start my answer by passing on for the record my sincere condolences to the family and friends uh, of the individual who died as a result of contracting, uh, now forgive me, streptophomus maltophilia infection. Uh, when an outbreak or incident is identified by a board, an incident management team is established to assess and manage a situation. Clearly, the specific control measures required to prevent further cases and ensure patient safety is tailored to the nature of the bacteria identified and how it is spread. NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde has worked with Health Protection Scotland to ensure those additional appropriate infection control measures uh, have been put in place and remain in place for the incidents reported across NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde and including the Royal Alexandra Hospital. Neil Bibby. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. Yesterday, Healthcare Protection Scotland published a report on a recent inspection at the RAH which found staffing gaps in the domestic cleaning rota and issues with the maintenance of the estate. This is very concerning, comes after recent serious inf infections across the health board area, including, as the Cabinet Secretary said, a bacterial infection in the RAH hospital that contributed to the death of one patient. Does the Cabinet Secretary believe that the standards of cleanliness found in the report are sufficient? And what is the government doing to ensure our hospital environments are maintained and that there are no staffing gaps in domestic cleaning rotas? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, thank you very much. I'm grateful to Mr Bibby for his supplementary. He is uh, absolutely correct in terms of uh, his analysis of what that report said, and I uh, take that very seriously. I was uh, very concerned to read about uh, those gaps in the cleaning rota and in maintenance because, of course, uh, cleaning and domestic services and maintenance are critical elements uh, of infection prevention and control. Uh, and uh, my officials, uh, including uh, the new uh, Director General uh, for Health and uh, Chief Executive of NHS Scotland, uh, are in daily contact with NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde, picking up on those matters, checking uh, the additional work that they are doing to ensure that they address these concerns. And I have a daily update uh, to ensure uh, that I am kept up to date with that too and are pursuing some of these issues directly with them. In terms of other health boards across the country, then we, uh, as we have done, uh, seek assurance uh, with them in terms of uh, the data that they have on their uh, staff numbers in terms of uh, domestic and cleaning work and maintenance uh, and where we are identifying what we consider to be unacceptable gaps in that and there is no uh, immediate plan uh, to fill those gaps, then we are pursuing that with those health boards in order to ensure that they do precisely that and they look to ensure that they have uh, all those vacancies uh, filled as far as they possibly can. Question 13, Murdo Fraser. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I'm gi I'd given up on you, uh, Presiding Officer. Um, <laughs> to, to ask the Scottish <laughs> Government what action it is taking to ensure the full reopening of the Bitlockery Minor Injuries Unit. Cabinet Secretary. Yes, I'd almost given up on you too, Mr Fraser, but <laughs> never, ever, never, ever. Uh, the Pitlochry Minor Injuries Unit uh, current opening hours are Monday to Friday between 9 and 4.30. Out with these hours appropriate out of our services, including a nurse or a GP, can be accessed through NHS 24 by calling treble one. The Perth and Kinross Health and Social Care Partnership is continuing to run a recruitment exercise to appoint additional staff with the specialist skills required in order to support the full opening hours of this minor, in, minor injuries unit, which, as I understand it, was from 9am to 9pm. Murder Fraser. Can, can I thank the, the Cabinet Secretary for uh, that response? She, she will know that the minor injuries unit uh, at Pitlockery is now closing at 4.30 on the weekday and has been closed uh, at weekends for some months now, which is causing a great deal of frustration to residents in Highland Perthshire who face the alternative, a long journey to the nearest alternative, which is in Perth. So what specific action can the Scottish Government take to support NHS Tayside to try and find replacement staff to try and ensure that that important local facility is reopened to the full extent? Cabinet Secretary. 
So um, our work continues with um, NHS Tayside to look at the detail of the particular problems that they are addressing and whether or not there are additional uh, measures and steps that they can take in order to improve uh, their uh, opportunity to recruit the staff that they need and whether or not they are looking uh, as um, uh, widely as possible at what should be the appropriate staff mix. Uh, so we continue to have those discussions. Um, it's important that members understand that where we are aware of situations like uh, this one, which has gone on for some time, that we do directly uh, get in touch with the relevant, uh, both health board, but also the local health and social care partnership to understand the detail of what they are doing and suggest to them ways perhaps that have been tried elsewhere and been more successful that they might look to adopt or additional measures that we as a government may be able to assist them with. So we are continuously in that work with uh, Perth and Kinross Health and Social Care Partnership and with NHS Tayside, and I'm happy to update the member on the detail of what we've been doing. Thank you very much. And that does conclude portfolio questions. And we're going to move on in a few moments' time to the next item, which is a debate on the Hutchison's Hospital Transfer and Dissolution Bill. We'll just take a few moments for the members and minister to change seats.